thanks a lot, Bill. And thanks to all of you for coming. I was hoping for 10 or 15 people, and so this is great. And I've got a lot of slides. The slides have a lot of words and pictures on them that I can't possibly get through. Part of it is there for distraction from what I'm saying. And uh, I don't want you to worry because two hours is going to fly by like nothing. <laughs> so so um, at first, I think I should really uh, apologize to members of the English division because I'm really pretty far out of my territory now. Uh, on the other hand, uh, anthropology is not as far removed from comparative literature and literature as uh, some people might think. And uh, this relationship with literature and anthropology goes back at least a century. Um, so that's my yes but apology. I didn't start off thinking about Joyce or wanting to read Joyce or knowing anything about Joyce. Uh, but I did read David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest. This book right here. Has anybody read Infinite Jest? Are there any David Foster Wallace fans here? This book is an amazing book. It is almost a thousand pages long. It's got another hundred pages of footnotes, mostly about the details of various drugs. And it's uh, pretty complicated, but it, it w I think it's awful. It did not engage me whatsoever. <laughs> and I, I apologize to David Foster Wallace fans. I'm a fan of his nonfiction, uh, but not this uh, example of his fiction. His nonfiction is wonderful and uh, I, I show my uh, first day of classes uh, in the semester, I show his, his 2005 commencement address, This is Water, which he gave at Kenyon College, uh, uh, which is a great introduction to uh, the importance of liberal arts. So I, I'm not anti-David uh, Foster Wallace, only anti-Infinite Jest. But I wanted to read something exciting and interesting. So there was this book laying over on the side called Ulysses, and I thought, oh, this should be great. This is going to be exciting. This guy fights a war for 10 years, then he wanders around for 10 years, he, he tangles with the gods and goddesses. Oh my God, he sees the Cyclops, he, he is taunted by the sirens. You know, it's an incredibly exciting story. So I started reading it. And the version I read was by this guy, James Joyce. And it's not at all like like Homer's Ulysses, but it's, it's uh, every bit as exciting in its own way. It's a difficult read. It's really challenging, but it's as rewarding as it is challenging. So I'm here to promote Ulysses and maybe a couple of other aspects of Joyce. <coughs> and um, in doing so, I, I, I uh, hope that I don't trample too much on what those experts in the audience know about Joyce, Professor Reginio and uh, Ben Howard and Lou Greif. So I stand, I'm a beginner, I'm ready to be corrected any time, but here we go. So this book, Ulysses, um, you see some of the quotes. Uh, I'm, oh, how many people have read Ulysses uh, from front to back? That is very impressive. So five or six people. Good. The book was published in 1922. Joyce worked on it for seven years. According to Joyce, he spent 20,000 hours working on it. It's a book of 18 episodes, not chapters, but episodes. It has 268,000 words in it. It has 30,000 uh, individual words. And uh, depending on the edition, 643 or some pages. As soon as he published it on his birthday in 1922, February 2nd, uh, he started making corrections to it. It was a rush job. You know what happens with those rush papers. Uh, and so over the next, I don't know, couple of years uh, and thereafter, really, uh, he and others came up with 2,000 to 5,000 editorial changes that needed to be made in the original published manuscript. Most of them are pretty small, but still, that's a lot of uh, variation in the different editions. It's also a pretty handy-dandy book to find in your attic. Uh, ask your grandparents 
to look in their attics, if they have a copy of Ulysses from 1922, if it was signed by James Joyce, uh, it will pay off any student's college loans and maybe a couple of the loans of their friends. It's, it's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Or you could donate it to me, <laughs> and I would take good care of it. So, what's it about? What's your list? Ulysses, Ulysses is about basically three people on one day in Dublin, June 16th, 2000, uh, 1904. These are the three people. Leopold Bloom, 38 years old. This is a sketch that looks a little bit like Charlie Chaplin, who was one of Joyce's daughter's favorite entertainers. Um, Stephen Dedalus, you'll hear more about each of these in a few minutes. And Molly Bloom, married to Leopold Bloom. Um, it's set in Dublin, like all of Joyce's work, except for one 16-page uh, short story, which wasn't published until after his death. Uh, and, and Joyce's dealing with Dublin is of an ethnographic uh, level of detail and quality. <coughs> Two of these people, Leopold and Molly, are married, and they live at an address which has become as famous to lots of Joyce fans anyway, as two other addresses which I bet you know in London. That is, what's the address of the um, Prime Minister, 10, number 10 Downing Street? What's the address of that fictional? <laughs> excellent, excellent. See, now, this is about number 7 Eccles Street. It starts off at number 7 Eccles Street in Dublin and it ends up at number 7 Eccles Street in Dublin. And uh, between 8 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the next morning, uh, a lot of things happen, but we wouldn't really call it action. Why did Joyce decide upon June 16th, uh, 1904 for this novel, this novel of one day? He decided to use that day because that's the day of his first date with the woman who, with whom he eloped in a few months after 2004 and whom he eventually married in 1931, with whom he had two children, Nora Barnacle. He, he was moonstruck by her when he saw her a few days before. He was so taken by her and then he hoped to meet her again on the 15th of June. She didn't show up. He sent her a note card with this message on it which you can read and hold in your hand at Cornell's James Joyce collection. And, and then they did get together on the following day. And according to um, what Joyce has said about that first date, I'm quoting Joyce, she made a man of him. He says that in several places. <coughs> so Ulysses, was published after years of labor. He was writing a few other things. We'll get back to that maybe later. He wrote a few other things before Ulysses. He, then he, he worked on Ulysses for these seven years. He couldn't, he had trouble finding a publisher. Uh, several episodes got published in a small American literary magazine until they got confiscated by customs for being obscene. And he finally found this very kind woman, Sylvia Beach, who said, hi, let, m let me publish it at my bookstore, through my bookstore, Shakespeare and Company in Paris. And uh, that's how Shakespeare, I mean, how, that's how Ulysses was born. And these are some of the uh, notices and subscription uh, um, efforts that you can, you can see also in the Buffalo collection of James Joyce. You can see the little subscription card from T.S. Eliot, from Ernest Hemingway, from Andre Gide, and a whole bunch of other notables. <coughs> and Ulysses
Yay for you, man. been in multiple editions, and because there were so many problems with the, the editorial details of it, it keeps coming out in a new edition every few years, uh, and there is such a uh, hotly debated uh, venom over exactly what should be in the details of the corrections and what should not be. It's just classic academic uh, vitriol hurled at people trying to make the best effort to present the best possible manuscript to read. The, the one that uh, I read is this one over here, the Gabler edition, which is really a very accessible, easier to read edition. Because when it was first published and in many of these succeeding editions, there are no breaks between episodes. There are no numbers or titles for the episodes. The only way you can tell that there's been a change in episode is by the change in the writing style. So it's, it's not an easy book to grapple with unless you have uh, some help. But in fact, there are plenty of ways to access it. Um, Joyce liked to play around with people. Joyce had a vast sense of humor and also liked the challenge of embedding all kinds of things in his books. And so he famously said this thing about putting so many puzzles and enigmas in his work. For the, for the last work, Finnegan's Wake, as you'll see eventually, if we have time, uh, he wrote to one of his closest friends saying, uh, is it obscure enough? I can make it more obscure if you like. <coughs> so in Ulysses, you can find all kinds of things, and you can pursue all kinds of little mysteries, little academic intellectual mysteries. And there, there are things like this up-up business, which are still not clearly explained. And uh, his, his A-E-I-O-U is a little clever um, uh, note that he owes some money to, to this other writer of the time. This tatarat tat is the longest uh, palindrome, longest single word palindrome in English. You know, he, he's just endlessly playing with things. <coughs> and since he's not, uh, it's not a book that you can just pick up and breeze through uh, without any assistance unless you're, you know, versed in this and, and very good at Latin and several other languages, there are many different helps for this book that make it accessible and make it in really pleasurable to investigate. Um, the, the best biography that, sorry, the best biography available is this one, which is a classic uh, in literary biographies, said by many people to be one of the best biographies of anyone in the 20th century. Uh, there are these kinds of books, especially this one, the annotations for Ulysses, that explain what every one of his references is, or almost every one of his references, but don't interpret it. Um, there are various interpretations of it. So in other words, if you're willing to invest the time in Ulysses, you can uh, read it at a pretty serious level and enjoy it. And what emerges from that, for those of us in uh, liberal arts, is a mini course in liberal arts and sciences because Joyce embeds plenty in there about science at the time. <coughs> All right, let's go back to the book and see who these people are. Uh, Leopold Bloom is probably the central character, the central person in the book. Um, he's, he's a little strange. He carries a potato in his pocket for good luck to protect him from diseases. He carries a bar of Sweeney soap in his pocket, which he's just bought, that he has to carry around all day so he can take it home to Molly. He's, he loves uh, burnt kidneys, which is the first thing he prepares in the book. He, um, he's always thinking about ads. Joyce dealt with the power of advertising in this book, and Leopold Bloom is an ad canvasser. And he's always trying to figure out new ads. In fact, the last thing he's thinking about after he gets home at 3 a.m. and is lying down in bed with Molly with his feet at her head and his head at her feet is 
the best ad imaginable that would bring everything to a stop. But Bloom is much more than that. He's somebody who, uh, unlike other characters in the book, uh, is very even-handed. He's, he's very fair-minded. He hates violence. He's, uh, he may feel uh, very much in turmoil internally, but outside he's very composed and calm. <coughs> he doesn't drink uh, hardly anything in the novel, unlike uh, most of the other characters. And he's always thinking of this uh, bunch of, of uh, topics. He's thinking about Molly, he's thinking about this food, ads, his daughter Millie, his uh, infant uh, son Rudy who didn't live but 11 days, uh, Greek statues and whether they're anatomically correct, uh, other uh, women he has known, food, uh, Josie, another uh, woman he spends some time talking to, Molly, Boylan, this uh, dandy uh, guy who's about to have sex with Molly at 4 o'clock on the afternoon of June 16th, uh, his father, um, Molly, and ads. I mean, the, his mind is all over the place. The action in Ulysses is between the ears. Bloom uh, covers uh, Protestantism and Catholicism, but his background is Jewish, and he has to cope with a great deal of anti-Semitism uh, throughout the story. <coughs> and Molly even says, uh, you know, gee, gee, Poldy, you're not Irish enough. But nobody in the book says, gee, Molly, you're not Irish enough, even though your mother was from southern Spain and you were born in Gibraltar. So Bloom, if you want to interpret Bloom, he is a, a no man, every man, Christ-type figure, all kinds of things. He is Ulyssian in his um, persistence. <coughs> but there are others. Stephen Dedalus is an interesting character. Uh, Stephen Dedalus was written about by Joyce much earlier. In fact, Joyce's uh, long unpublished manuscript, Stephen Hero, is the first version written in the early 1900s of this, this person, this young man, this artist. This story eventually came to light as a portrait of the artist as a young man, the book which gained uh, Joyce his first great fame. And he is often taken as a representative of Joyce. He is and he isn't, of course, the way uh, characters in novels sometimes are like their authors and sometimes differ from them, of course. But he is all of these things. He is, he represents the artistry of a uh, cocky, arrogant, self-assured, brilliant guy. He knows everything there is to know about Shakespeare and Hamlet especially. <coughs> but guess what? He's lonely. Doesn't really have any friends. And he says all kinds of strange things, like he talks about the ineluctable modality of the visible. And as Joyce is prone to do throughout the book, he uses all kinds of uh, sesquipedalian words, but uh, he also will use every cliche that you can think of, I'm sure, every familiar, common word and cliche. <coughs> um, I guess we better keep moving. Molly um, is a singer. She's a soprano, and she's not bad. She's modestly good. By the way, Joyce himself was... Uh, a singer. He could have had a career as a singer. He had a beautiful tenor voice, supposedly. Uh, he won singing contests. He uh, chose to be a writer and an artist in the style of uh, Stephen Dedalus, uh, at least for uh, in many ways. But Molly, who isn't, who doesn't appear directly in the story until the very last episode, episode 18 is referred to by people Bloom talks to, usually in slightly suggestive, sometimes derogatory ways. <coughs> and 
she's uh, portrayed generally, at least until the last episode, as fairly simple, that she doesn't like intellectualizing, she doesn't understand big words, but she certainly has some big thoughts by the time we get to her directly at the end. <coughs> when we meet her, her first words are, mmm, as Bloom is, is getting breakfast for her and asks if she wants the shades up or anything. And then her last words are the most famous words in the book, which are across the bottom here and which you'll see again. So those are the three characters. And here's the story. I'm sketching it out for you. You don't even have to read it now. It's in, the book's in three parts. The first three episodes have to do with Stephen Dedalus. We follow him uh, from 8 a.m. to about 11, maybe 12 in the morning. Um, then we shift gears in episode four and pick up the story with Leopold Bloom, who's uh, fixing kidneys and going out shopping and going to the public baths and then going to church and then going to a funeral and, and uh, all these kinds of things. And uh, he has uh, a grotesque lunch uh, that is very famous. And um, uh, he does all these other things that are listed here. He goes to another bar where there's an incredible episode of uh, siren-like fugues bouncing back and forth through the words that Joyce is able to create. Um, it's uh, one uh, fascinating portrayal of one little tiny aspect of life in Dublin in 1904, uh, according to Joyce. And then by late at night, by midnight, Bloom and Stephen, by this time, end up at a brothel, Bella Cohen's brothel in Nighttown, Dublin. And this episode is, is uh, one of the most famous, it's certainly the most cinem cinemagraphic. Uh, the stage directions for this are detailed. The uh, nightmarish scene jumps around all over the place. The strangest, most bizarre, horrifying things happen. Um, it's riveting uh, and um, is the pinnacle of uh, Bloom and Stephen being out. Then gears change again and Bloom takes Stephen home, f takes him first to a cab shelter where he can sober up. <coughs> then he walks him home to his house at, what's that street? Number seven, Eccles Street. <laughs> where they have the most fascinating exchange written in a completely different style of, of uh, Joyce's uh, catechismic question and answer style. And then Stephen leaves. Bloom invites him home, even after Stephen has sung the most shocking uh, anti-Semitic ballad. Uh, and then... Stephen decides not to stay over, although he's been invited, and uh, in fact, Molly has, uh, imagines great things happening if Stephen would just stay over. And Stephen leaves, and he's never heard from again, or written about again, by Joyce. <coughs> Bloom goes to bed, falls asleep, and then we are privy to Molly's innermost uh, monologue in the last episode. Or we could look at the book this way. This is the uh, Joycean Homeric structure. This is the structure that Joyce used for the 18 episodes, but did not really reveal except to a couple of people until he allowed his friend uh, Stuart Gilbert to publish this in 1930 in the first study of Ulysses. But you can see the, uh, this, this gives you a hint of the uh, extreme, detailed, careful construction that Joyce put into Ulysses. Every episode uh, has uh, a scene, an hour, most of them have an organ, a color, a symbol, an art, and a technique. And it's not quite as simple as that makes it seem either, but it's all there. Or, I, I kind of like the subway map. This way you can, you can really follow much more easily uh, Yes? Stephen Dedalus in green and his uh, 
interactions or passing interactions with Leopold Bloom uh, in the different episodes. Or a very recent book by an Irishman whose name I don't know how to pronounce correctly, Declan Kybird, Kybird uh, published in 2011 uh, in an effort to, in a very accessible, very useful, readable effort to make Ulysses uh, pertinent to everyday life, as he says in the subtitle, uh, gives us these gerunds, which summarize pretty nicely what's going on here. Each one of the episodes has to do with these things. <coughs> or, you know, we can, we can get a little more literary and start looking at the themes of Ulysses. Ulysses is dense in themes. So, you know, whatever interests you is here. Here are a bunch of, a bunch of themes. Uh, if, you, if you're a musical at all, you will get a lot more out of Ulysses than I can get out of it, because I'm not musical. Uh, Joyce refers to many, many, many songs. Uh, Joyce uses the rhythm of his words to create a feeling of music. Uh, he is absolutely brilliant. But you could also look at uh, patriotism and nationalism. You can look at prejudice. You can look at religion. Something about each of these themes is important and commonplace in the book, available, accessible in the book. Colonialism, it's right there. Uh, there's probably something about fascism there, too. But it's mostly about love. According to Richard Elman, the uh, biographine, as Joyce called him in Finnegan's Wake. And that's probably true. But Joyce himself, what about this guy? Who was he? He was kind of an odd guy, but geniuses usually are. And he certainly um, could have done any number of things besides write, but he couldn't help it. He was an artist driven to write. And, and so he did. He loved words. He mastered probably nine languages. He could do anything with words he wanted to. He said so himself, and Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, and plenty of other people who are good with words agreed with him. Ezra Pound even referred to him as James Jesus. Uh, he was, uh, he liked words like this that, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, uh, the squander mania, and the next word is the longest Latin word. If you want to know the, what the longest word in Latin is, But his, his, his works his works were an occasion for mixing uh, comedy or comic approaches and very serious themes. But they're also kind of fun. I, I'm going to dare to read, probably very badly, an episode from the end of a chapter, uh, an episode where um, he has been, Bloom has been with a bunch of medical students at the hospital, and they're all rip-roaring drunk, and Bloom isn't. And um, Joyce has portrayed this scene with 30 different styles of writing, and he concludes with an, uh, the style, in the style of an American evangelist, probably Billy Sunday, if anybody is familiar with him. And, and this is Joyce's version of this um, hot gospeler, as he's called. Elijah is coming, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Come on, you wine-fizzling, gin-sizzling, booze-guzzling existences. Come on, you doggone, bull-necked, beetle-browed, hog-jowled, peanut-brained, weasel-eyed, four-flushers, false alarms, and excess baggage. Come on, you triple extract of infamy. Alexander J. Christ Dowie, that's my name. That's yanked to glory most half this planet, from Frisco Beach to Vladivostok. The deity ain't no nickel dime bum show. I put it to you that he's on the square and corking fine business proposition is the grandest thing yet, and you don't forget it. Shout salvation in King Jesus. You'll need to rise precious early, you sinner there, if you want to diddle the almighty God. Fap. There's somebody throwing up in the background. <laughs> Not half. He's got a cough mixture with a punch in it for you, my friend, in his back pocket. Just you try it on. 
And it'd be much better to hear Joyce, I'm sure, read that. But Joyce didn't allow many recordings of his voice, reading any of his works. There are only two. Uh, you can get them both on YouTube. Uh, a very short reading from another section of Ulysses and a slightly longer reading from uh, Finnegan's Wake. But they're definitely worth checking out. <coughs> so, um, you can, you, you know, these couple of these quotes are, are intended to illustrate Joyce's irreverence. Uh, but we'll get back to irreverence later. And I was trying to figure out, you know, how could I illustrate maybe the, I don't know if it's illustrating the complexity or the muddleness or the, the reach of uh, literary critics when they approach uh, Ulysses. I thought, what would be simple? And I thought, well, the simplest thing that I can think of is probably the, the, interpretations of the black dot at the end of episode 17. Okay, so we're just going to see what the critics have thought of a black dot. It doesn't get much simpler than that. It, it gets a lot simpler if I can uh, show it. If you couldn't see the, the black dot that I just held up in front of you, it's not because it's so small and so far away, it's because it's not there. <laughs> and it's not there for, for different reasons, but when it is there, and when it should have been there, according to some literary critics, these are the interpretations that, these are not all the interpretations, these are just some of the interpretations which I came upon in uh, studying Ulysses. You know, maybe it's Bloom's seed with which he's going to fertilize Molly. Maybe it's darkness and brightness, following up on some lines just before the end of the episode. Oh, I think it's the, the QED of the logical proposition that's embedded in the novel elsewhere. Well, no, I think it heightens the importance of celestial events. A black dot can do that. Maybe it's the seed from which Bloom might flower. There's a whole theme of symbols of flowers throughout this. Or according to the first printer who caused all this trouble, uh, it was just an error and he didn't print it. So, so other editions had to go back and include it. All right. Anyway, you know, I have to keep moving because we've got a lot more ground to cover. So the end of Ulysses is Molly thinking. She's reviewed all kinds of fascinating things. Molly is a complex feminist uh, individual, and um, she reviews her, her love life, what she thinks about men, her own uh, history, uh, all kinds of things, really. And then she ends with a very affirmative statement, a famous affirmative statement. One of the most famous lines, I don't know, your English professors can probably dispute this, but one of the more famous lines in literature. Um, his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said yes, I will yes. She's, she's affirming her relationship with Leopold Bloom. <coughs> and and so this, is, this gets a lot of discussion, lots of discussion. And, you know, if you want to stay afterwards, we could talk about the word yes. <laughs> but I have to keep moving. So just, just to summarize Ulysses before we move on, um, I think this little cartoon on the left is a pretty good summary. So one day, Leo Bloom, junior ad executive in Dublin, fixes some crapple for breakfast. Mmm. There's a lucky potato in his pocket. He runs some errands, tends a funeral. His mind wanders. After lunch, he stops by the beach and checks out the action as a silent romance, according to one way of describing it. 
Later, he bumps into his mopey pal, Steven. Steve, they do some epic bar hopping. Both their minds wander a lot. A lot. But smooth move, Steve, breaks a lamp so they get tossed out of the brothel. Their minds wander some more. And then uh, Leo leads home to his wife, Molly, who's really hot but yakky. This is a, a very, uh, you know, sexist, unfair uh, way of portraying it, but it's a cartoon. <coughs> but Ulysses got censored in the United States, censored from 1922 until 1933. And this is really pretty, a pretty interesting story, I think. Why would it be censored? It w was it dirty? Was it obscene? Was it pornographic? Well, um, looking back on it, uh, a writer in The Economist last year said, you know, geez, this is a comic artifact of the United States' prudishness. And um, there's some to that. But uh, let's look at the story of the, the trial of Ulysses. And what happened was that uh, Bennett Cerf and Random House orchestrated the seizure of many copies of Ulysses in order to test whether it was indeed uh, censorable. And this ended up in federal court in 1933. Federal judge, federal New York judge, John Woolsey, uh, came to a decision. And he, he wrote this decision. You can read the decision, which is interesting writing in itself, int an interesting account in itself, and published with many of the editions of Ulysses. And in it, uh, he determined, he came to his decision by reading the book in, in its entirety himself. That's good. He used some of the, the AIDS uh, other books, Stuart Gilbert's, or Gilbert Stewart's book, uh, and I don't know what else at the time. He said he spent many weeks reading it. And <coughs> then uh, he, he tested, he wanted to test, the test really, the legal test was whether it was obscene. And the definition of obscene it is tending to stir the sex impulses or to lead to sexually impure or lustful thoughts. That's, that is what all this comes down to. So was Ulysses obscene? Well, what Judge Woolsey did was he had a couple of his friends read the book also. He doesn't tell us who they were. Um, he had checked with two respected friends of, quote, average sex instincts. <laughs> <laughs> and they had them independently read Ulysses in order to determine whether it was obscene according to the legal definition of the word. His two friends did not find it obscene. And so neither did Judge John Woolsey. And he said in his decision, he said it was somewhat tragic, it was sincere, it was emetic, but it was not obscene. And then he concludes reminding his readers that his choices, locale was Celtic and his season was spring. <laughs> <laughs> There's one of the famous lines uh, that brought this suit. Random House was ready to go. So in December 1933, Woolsey said, no problem, it's not obscene. Everybody can print and read this. And so Bennett Surf at Random House immediately started publishing this and starting promoting it. And he started promoting it with uh, an ad which he inserted into uh, popular uh, magazines of the time, Cornhusker and says things in this, this is being called as an article about this, it's great, the, the strangest literary ad ever. And <coughs> so this says, um, with a plot furnished by Hamlet against a setting by Dante, with characters motivated by Shakespeare, Ulysses is really not as difficult to comprehend as critics like to pretend. It's a, it's a book, it's a great illustration of the tension that really has seems always to have existed for Ulysses, a tension between um, high literature and high brow literary critics on the one hand, and uh, a more, you know, a less elite group of readers on the other hand. 
uh, and there's always conflict between these over the, over the publishing history of Ulysses. Okay, taking much too long with this. That's the ad. Um, those, are, those are different scenes from the story, which will mean something to people who've read it. Um, the story uh, continues on, but I'll have to keep going. Um, Joyce wrote more than Ulysses. Let's move on to something else. He wrote poems. He wrote uh, a book of short stories. This is everything that Joyce wrote. That wasn't prolific. Uh, he didn't write very much. <coughs> um, but he did write this book, which I bet a lot of people have read. How many people have read A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man? Yeah. This is the book most read by Joyce. A great book. It's that Stephen Dedalus character uh, moving toward his independence as an artist with famous quotes on it. Are you not weary of ardent ways? Welcome, O life. Once upon a time, a moo cow is coming down the road. But I'd rather focus on, during our last hour, uh, <laughs> Joyce's grand finale, which is Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake makes Ulysses seem like an easy read. But it's, it in itself is worth the challenge and uh, is an astonishing book. However, it was published in 1939. There was a lot going on in 1939. Most people didn't care for it whatsoever. Uh, Nora wouldn't read it, nor did she read Ulysses. Uh, Nora referred to it as that chop suey you're writing. Uh, literary critic uh, called it the doodles of a disappointed blind man. Um, I have to to uh, give you uh, Vladimir Volkov's uh, uh, view of it. Finnegan's Wake is nothing but a formless and dull mass of phony folklore, a cold putting of a book, a persistent snore in the next room, most aggravating to the insomniac that I am. Moreover, I always detested regional literature, full of quaint, old-timers, and imitated pronunciation. Finnegan's Wake disguises a very conventional and drab tenant house, tenement house, and only the infrequent snatches of heavenly intonations redeem it from utter insipidity. I know I'm going to be excommunicated from this house. <laughs> that was, uh, and Vladimir Nabokov was no slouch writer himself. <clears throat> Finnegan's Wake, 628 pages, standardized. Every edition of Finnegan's Wake has 628 pages pages, which is a good thing if you want to read it. Again, 218,000 words, very challenging. Um, <coughs> it's a book of double ends, double ends jined, meaning that the concluding sentence, <coughs> away alone, alas, a loved along the, really takes the reader back to the first sentence in the book. And guess what? David Foster Wallace does almost the same thing in Foster Wallace, just is very influenced by Joyce, uh, Joyce plus uh, 50 or 60 years. So <coughs> these are some of uh, Joyce's own Finnegan's Wakeian comments on, on himself and the book. Who and how, Gal how Hegel wrote this darn thing anyhow. But it did get him on the cover of Time magazine. Joyce worked for 17 years to create this. And all of the notebooks that went into, that Joyce used to produce Finnegan's Wake can be found at the poetry collection at the University of Buffalo, which uh, Professor Eugenio directed me toward, and is wonderful. <coughs> um, this is a book of words, even more than almost any other book that I know of or that critics refer to is a book of words. So Joyce continuously plays with words, nonstop. Dublin becomes all of those words. Uh, tit for tat becomes all of those variations. Um, paradox lust is paradise lost. Uh, Pennsylvania is Pennsylvania. Song of a birch, the Eiffel Tower becomes awful tours, and so on and so on. Uh, the physicist picked a word out of this book. Um, Quark, quark. Anybody heard of a quark? It's from Finnegan's Wake, 1963. Gelman. Uh, it's pure music. 
These books should be read aloud according to Joyce and to others. <coughs> um, Finnegan's Wake is a great comic vision. Anthony Burgess uh, viewed it that, and others have viewed it that way too. But, you know, Anthony Burgess is the author of what? Clockwork Orange. Therefore, you might, eh, might want to check out what other people think. Um, Joyce was incredibly irreverent. Joyce had a lifelong struggle with the Roman Catholic Church and uh, displayed his struggle in, in his words. In the name of the former and of the latter and of their Holocaust, all men. He's also uh, quite vulgar, but he, in Finnegan's Wake at least, uh, he does it in words from 62 other languages. Um, what's it about? You know, we're not going to have time. But these are what some of the critics say. There's no agreement. You can read it, you can think whatever you want about it, and that's okay, basically. Finnegan's Wake is like Dr. Seuss on steroids. It's like Aesop on Uzo with a little peyote thrown in. <laughs> it's like, it's a uh, dream, it's a night, uh, it's a book of the night as Ulysses is a book of the day. How many people have read Finnegan's Wake? Forgot to ask that. Start to finish. Excellent. <coughs> but your, your numbers are fewer. I'll borrow what my Aha. Uh -huh. Well, you know, in, in talking about Finnegan's Wake, to read always comes in quotation marks. Uh, it's a, not a straightforward story. I know some of you in the audience have incredibly elaborate, detailed dreams that may uh, be so complex you're left wondering what in the heck is going on in my head. And that's sort of like uh, something like Finnegan's Wake. Uh, I don't have time to do this, but just I was going to parallel this with the dot. This is an illustration in Finnegan's Wake. What does it mean? It's a map. I know I've got to stop soon. It's uh, double O's, Dunlop tires, cycles. Finnegan's Wake is about a cycle. <coughs> the, it's about the river. It's um, that. It's that. It's that. It's that. And most interpreters emphasize that it has to do with the female, um, central female person in the book um, and her sexuality. Joyce, this is Joyce's biography, basically. His father, his brother, Joyce in between, Nora, his two children. But he died in 1941. He was a man who had many eye operations. He was practically blind during his last years. He had all kinds of problems. Um, and I, I especially like this photograph of him about which he said in 1938, at last, a photograph I can enjoy looking at. <clears throat> but he lives on. I'm, al I'm almost finished. You've been very patient. And what I think is fascinating about him is how many ways he is still um, encountered, appreciated, enjoyed, remembered uh, even today. But amazingly enough, the two greatest collections of Joyceana in the world are within a couple of hours of us. One at the University of Buffalo, one at Cornell. But, you know, you can get coffee mugs and t-shirts. He's consumed. He's translated. I can't imagine the skill of a translator who can do this. He's been digitized. He's been toured and dissected. He's been pubbed performed, played, heard, bought, crossword puzzled, filmed repeatedly. He has, he has 163,000 likes on Facebook, for gosh sakes. And the man's been dead for 60 or 70 years. <clears throat> He's still being published. He's yesed a lot. And every Bloomsday, every June 16th is Bloomsday. He is celebrated. And Marilyn Monroe even read it. But I don't know if she read the whole thing because she seems to be in chapter in episode 18. And 
uh, a writer last uh, June in Dublin, in the Irish Times, put it this way. He's been, uh, Joyce has become to Dublin as goofy as to Walt Disney World. He's in statues everywhere. Um, he's fun. Uh, people who start congas at office parties meet this criteria of being fun. Not so long ago, we immersed ourselves in modernist literature as a way of escaping fun and all its grinning acolytes. Again, this tension between a serious encounter with Joyce and uh, a popular, accessible encounter with Joyce. He's been atomized, and uh, I hope, I, I'm finished now, but I hope that you don't feel like frothing at the gob, and I hope that you will take time to encounter seriously James Joyce uh, in any of his works, but especially Ulysses. So thank you very much for coming.